Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369 0703 768 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Our Father, we give you thanks this morning. We are grateful to you for your faithfulness. You have been so good to us. You have been so kind in revealing your mind unto us. A little here, a little there. You are instructing us. Father, we are very grateful that you are mindful of us. Take all the glory, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. We commit our lives to you. We know that you are setting your eyes on us to use us in the nations. Father, we pray that as we sit at your feet again to listen to you, Lord, let it please you to speak to us. Let it please you, O oh God, to show us your mind. Let it please you to pour your grace upon our lives. The grace of God that will enable us to do what you want us to do. The divine enablement that makes us to obey God. Lord, we pray that this grace will be poured upon us, that we will never remain the same again. Going from here, we will be women with a difference. Something good will happen to us. People will identify us with Christ and with his kingdom and his kingdom agenda in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray that you yourself, you will grant us your divine encounter. You will speak and we will hear you. Unblock our ears. Open our hearts. Father, open our hearts at a time like this when you have a reason to visit our nations. Open our hearts, oh God. Cause us to hear you. Let nobody hear us saying there is nothing we can do. There is a lot that you want to involve us in that will spark the fire of revival in the church and in the nations. Father, Father, we plead with you that nothing will hinder us. We ask, oh Lord, that you will speak to us. We pray that we will hear you clearly, even beyond what anybody can say. You are the one who does that kind of thing. Lord, please do it again and let your name be glorified. We give you thanks. We give you praise because you will speak. We give you thanks because you will give us understanding. We give you thanks because there will be light and darkness will disappear from our hearts. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. This morning, we are going to listen to the Lord as he charges us to take responsibility. Take responsibility. It's not enough to hear God. You must be ready to take responsibility. God is not going to go into the bush, into the marketplace or somewhere else to go and look for those he will use. It is those he is speaking to that he normally engages to take responsibility. So this morning, as we hear God, God is saying, you take responsibility. We are going to read our theme text this morning. We'll read first from the book of Nehemiah chapter one, uh, before we go to chapter two. Nehemiah chapter one, Verses 1 to 11. The words of Nehemiah, 
the son of Akaliah. It came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was, when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and the statutes nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now, these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cup bearer. May the Lord bless his word in our hearts as we consider it together in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, this was the background for the theme of this meeting. The children of Israel had been carried away into captivity, into Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had attacked Israel because of the disobedience of the people, the backsliding of God's people. And he, he destroyed many things. And he carried away many into captivity in Babylon. Nehemiah was one of those he took away alive. Many must have died, but he took people away captive to come and serve him in Babylon. And Nehemiah was one of them. By this time that we are talking, uh, Nehemiah was already the cup bearer of the king. He was in a very high position. You know what that means. Cup bearers in those days, they must normally taste the wine before the king drinks it which means he was in such a wonderful position that what the king tasted, he tasted it first. You know how he could have indulged himself in all those things. He was in the palace. He was the king's cup bearer. And one of his brothers came to him to visit him, a nanny by name. The Bible says, uh, that man, when he arrived from Judah, Nehemiah asked concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. I want us to take note of that. Because, you see, no matter how much we speak, 
If God does not give you concern, a concern for your people, a concern for those in the body of Christ in your nation, and for the nation itself, you will go back into your, your status quo. You will not be able to rise up to do anything. Even though he was enjoying himself in the palace, he was, he was having a good job. And you know what it means to be a king's cup bearer. He was there enjoying himself, though in the captivity of Babylon. But then, not, he lacked nothing. He was just there enjoying. He could have settled there enjoying himself. He could have been there and just say, thank God. Even though they carried me away, thank God I was not killed. Thank God, see me now, I'm even the king's cup bearer. I must taste wine before the king tasted. it. He, he could have reveled in that. He could have settled in that. He could have been comfortable with that. He could have, you know, been finding his own convenience in that. He could have just settled and enjoyed himself. But as long as this man was in the palace, I could see that his heart was in Jerusalem. He was in Babylon, but his heart was in Jerusalem. We have looked at being kingdom-minded in our Bible study. That is the kind of way God wants us to live, those of us who are children of God in our nations. Even though you are in, in Namibia, you are in Botswana, you are in Eswatini, you are in South Africa, your heart must be in the kingdom of God. Your heart, you must be kingdom-minded. Even though your body is in that nation, your mind, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, it said, since you have died with Christ, and you have been raised with Christ, set your mind, set your affections, not on things on the earth, but on things above. Many of us, we are, in our nations and our hearts are settled in our nations. Our hearts are utterly minded. We do not concern ourselves with the things of the kingdom. We don't even remember whether there is any kingdom anywhere. Somebody says as a, a ridicule to this Colossians chapter three, he said, we are not of those who are kingdom-minded and utterly irrelevant. In as much as that looks a bit true, but you see, if you are utterly minded and so you are utterly relevant, you are useless as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. You amass the things of this world around yourself. You are not kingdom-minded. You are wasting your time and your eternity. There is nothing that you will go to meet in heaven if you enter there at all. So the Lord is saying, even though you are here or not, don't be irrelevant, but you must not put your mind on the things of this world. You must be kingdom-minded. Look at what happened to uh, Nehemiah here. He was in Babylon, but he lived there as a pilgrim. His mind was in Jerusalem. He was Judah-minded. He was kingdom-minded. His mind was there. And so immediately Hanani came. That was the first thing he asked Hanani. That shows, you see, when your heart is somewhere, where your, uh, the Bible says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. That's why that was the first issue that he, he asked Hanani. He asked the nanny concerning the Jews who had escaped. God, God's mind is for us to be mindful of the people of God in your nation. Not just your little denomination, you must be mindful of your denomination. But then 
your denomination is not the only uh, Christian group in your nation. Please be kingdom minded. Think about the body of Christ in Eswatini. Think about the kingdom of God in South Africa. And think about, oh, how, how, how far has the kingdom of God been established in Botswana? How far has the kingdom of God occupied South Africa? So that when you are counting numbers and say, oh, in this CLR, 300 of us attended, 300 over 50 million. Can you say you are doing well? If you are kingdom minded, you will be sad. And you will be looking for ways of establishing the kingdom of God much more than what has happened now in your nation. Nehemiah was kingdom minded. He asked about the Jews. Now, what is the state of the church in your nation? What is the state of God's people in your nation? Don't just sit down there enjoying yourself because God has directed money into your bosom. Don't just sit down there unconcerned about what is happening to God's people and about what is happening to God's kingdom. You see, he did not only ask about the Jews, he asked about Jerusalem. Be concerned about the kingdom of God and about the nation, the nation. Be concerned about the politics of your nation. Be concerned about the economic situation, the educational situation. Be concerned, be concerned about the spiritual situation of your nation. Be concerned about it. Let all this be what occupied you. You will be concerned about the people of God and about your nation. That occupied Nehemiah's heart, even though he was in Babylon. That is how God wants us to live. That was how Jesus lived throughout his life here on earth. Even though he was here on earth and he was earthly relevant, very relevant. In fact, he was healing the sick. He was so relevant. He was doing good. He was very relevant. But yet he was kingdom minded. He would not go anywhere without turning even his healing onto preaching the kingdom. He would not go and eat in anybody's house without preaching the kingdom. He was kingdom minded. He always sought to establish the kingdom of God with every opportunity God gave him. Be kingdom minded. As we, as we try to round up this meeting, you must take responsibility. To, to, to be kingdom minded, to be God's ambassador, to be God's, God's man, God's woman in that nation. Let God not say, I have not got any woman. So Nehemiah asked about the Jews and he asked about the, 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 the Jerusalem. And they said to, to me, he said in verse three, the survivors who are left, from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Look at that. What he asked was what he was giving. He asked about the people and they told him about the people. If you are concerned about God's people, God will not hide it from you. He will reveal to you the true situation of the church in your nation. Don't say, but I'm a woman. What can I do? Don't say that. God has a lot as we have been looking at it from the scriptures in this meeting. He has a lot for us as women. They told Nehemiah, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. Oh, can you see? the reproach of God's people in your nation. Can you see how the devil and the world system have infiltrated into the church? The church is no more going to reach out to the world. The world is reaching out to the church. 
The world has crept in. Gay movement has crept into many nations, many in the church in many nations. How did it happen? It's because we are no longer reaching out to the world. They have taken us captive. Look at the distress in which the church is. Some, uh, our sister was saying the other day that when, when you go to church now, you don't find many young people. They are no longer interested in church. You will find them out there. They will be drinking out there. They will be in the sports stadium. The number you cannot get in church, go to the stadium, you will get it. In their millions, they are gathered there, stampeding one another. Sports has become the idol now that people worship. Look at the state of the church. Are you concerned? Nehemiah was concerned about the Jews. Are you concerned? They told him, oh, they are in great distress. Ah, they are in a great reproach. Look at our reproach. Look at it. People are laughing at us and say, you people, what are you doing there? You keep, you keep praying, praying, praying every day. Do you ever imagine that God answers your prayers? We are increasing. You are decreasing. Look at you. They are mocking us. Our sins will no longer let God answer our prayer. The stories we used to hear of old concerning revival is no more so a situation in which somebody will go to preach and people will receive healing, the blind will see, the lame will walk. There are fakes these days. People no longer, you know, God no longer so much show up. And nobody is bothered. You don't ask why. You don't seek God's face and say, ah, Lord, we have heard of you in time past. We have heard of your power, your great power that you manifested to our fathers. Why is it not manifesting now? If you are concerned, God will show you why. God is only looking for somebody who is concerned. As he was looking for somebody who is concerned in this palace, he got Nehemiah. And they told him, that's the situation of the people. You, do you know the situation of your people? Do you know the situation of the church in your nation? Or once you go to church and you go back and you take your lunch and your dinner and you deliver your children, you send them to school and you die. You are satisfied with that? You are earthly minded and you will perish with the world. Why don't you get concerned about the concerns of God and see whether God will not be concerned about your own concerns? They told him, oh, those people are in great distress and reproach. And they also told him about Jerusalem. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. What a reproach. Can you imagine that in many of our nations, the gates are already burned with fire? Every, every kind of thing comes in now. If gay movement comes, the door is open. If uh, any false doctrine comes, the door is open. If any wicked uh, thing comes, the door is open. The door is open. In many nations that were, you know, known for revival before, now many evil things are happening. Islam has taken over. The other day, I was reading a report. How, how Muslims and Hindus were fighting on the streets of Leicester in the United Kingdom. Ha! Abomination. It was never like that before. But we are not reproaching them. But if we don't take care, what happened to them will happen to us. And so that it will not happen, that's why God is calling on women to begin to carry this burden in the womb of our hearts. They told this man, the gates are burned with fire. Everything that wants to come in, comes in now at will and ravage the people. In the middle of the night, you will, you will see how the enemy can come in 
into the city of Jerusalem anytime and ravage the people and disappear before daybreak. This is happening in many of our nations. The gates have been burned with fire. Even the spiritual gates are burned with fire. Every wrong doctrine has a way of coming in. Nobody checks them. Even the church, they don't check them. In fact, they welcome them because they will receive some money, some grants. They welcome them. Mammon has become the God, even in the church. Are you concerned, my sister? Are you concerned about what is happening? Nehemiah was so bothered. When he heard, he said in verse 4, so it was. When I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. The battle against the church in our nations, the battle against our nations is not a, a one-day battle. It's not a battle that you will fight for one day and it will finish. It's a, it's a matter, it's a burden to carry and it may take many days. There are battles that are one-time battle, you fight, you conquer. There are prayers of ask and you will receive. But there are other prayers where you will knock and knock and knock and seek and seek and seek before you'll be able to find. Many Christians don't know about that. They only know the prayer of ask and receive. There are more prayers, serious prayers than that. Nehemiah said, I sat down. Why did he have to sit down? He had to think. Before you'll be able to carry a burden, a burden that will become a move of God, you must learn to sit down and think. Many women are thoughtless. As far as the kingdom of God is concerned, they don't think. They just, they just sympathize and say, oh, what a shame. Here, yeah. what a shame. And that's all. And then they go about their business because it has not touched them. They have not sat down to think. You must not be thoughtless from this meeting. Let the things happening to the church bother your heart. Let it become a concern in your heart. He said, I sat down when I heard these things and wept. Before you can weep, something must have touched your heart. He wept. Oh, God's people. Mind you, he was not in that suffering. So you can't say it's because he was there. For you like this, you are there. You are in that nation. And the things are happening and you don't know it. And it doesn't touch you. Your heart is not bothered. You will cry to God this morning. Like uh, uh, Rebecca cried. He said, why am I like this? Why am I like this? Why am I so dry hearted? Why is it that the concerns of God don't touch my heart? Change my heart, Lord. Make my heart to become soft. Make my heart to become touchable. Nehemiah was touched. He was concerned about the distress and about the walls of Jerusalem that he sat down. He thought deeply and he began to weep. Tears were flowing. Not only that, he mourned. He mourned. What does it mean to mourn? He thought about what God used to do for his people in time past compared with what was happening now. He mourned. He brought a mourning. Our people used to say, if you don't know how to think, you will not know how to weep. If you don't know how to think about what God used to do, those of you who have read about the stories of revival, even in Southern Africa, if you don't know how to think about the move of God and that it has stopped now, you will not know how to mourn. He mourned. 
Oh, he mourned, he wept. And he did that for many days. Can you also sit down? And you see, he didn't plan that. It was not even planned. But you can plan to, to wait on the Lord for days. After you have thought about the distress that the church is in and the state of your nation as a result, because once the church is in distress, the nation can never be at peace. Look at it all over the world. Once the nation, once the, 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 the people of God are in distress, the nation will not be at peace. Look at the Western world that God had visited seriously in revival before. And they were at peace because of that revival. They were at peace because God was at work. There was no war against them. Everybody lived in peace. But look at it now. Look at what is happening in the Western world now. There is a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of fighting, killing. In fact, they are killing one another. You can offend somebody and he will just bring out his gun and finish with you. No more peace. So when the church is in distress, the nation will not be at peace. That should make us to mourn. Look at our nations. We are not at peace. We are not in prosperity anymore. Things are happening. People are eating from the garbage can. This should make us to mourn for our people. And he mourned and wept for many days and he fasted. He said, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He sat in the presence of God, mourning and fasting. Mind you, that does not mean that he will not go and serve the king. He did not stay away because he was fasting and praying. He was fasting and praying before God, not before the king. He, and he had done this for many days. And the thing began to trouble his heart so much. And he began to pray. And look at his prayer. You will see the body of his heart in his prayer. He began to confess his sin and the sin of his fathers. He began to beg God and remind him of his promise. That's how to pray. You must take up a burden before God concerning the church and concerning the nation. He prayed. He reminded God of his word and of his promise. And after some days now, verse 11, he now said, he prayed, oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants of God. He knew he was not the only one praying. Don't assume that you are the only one. There are many other children of God who are crying to God about the nation. Play your part. Add your own voice. And the collective voice, God will hear. He prayed. He said, hear the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cup bearer. Which man was he talking about? He was talking about the king. Grant him favor in the sight of the king. He knew that even though he was carrying a body, by now, God was already putting it in his heart. Yes, you want me to revive the church. That's good. You want me to restore Jerusalem. Yes, that's fine but you are the one I will use. You are the one I will use. I discover that when Jesus was looking at the situation of the people in the book of Matthew chapter nine, and he saw them harassed and helpless, people who were like sheep without a shepherd, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and by every form of distress, the Bible says he had compassion on them. And he told the disciples, pray ye the Lord of the harvest. The harvest is plenteous, but laborers are few. 
Look at this multitude. Am I the only one that will face them? Pray. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he may send laborers. And as soon as he said that, I don't know, maybe those disciples quickly bent their, their heads to pray. And then chapter 10 opened. And when it was now to send people to go and meet the needs of the people that were harassed and helpless, he did not go to the synagogue. He did not go to the market. He did not go to the temple. He sent the disciples that were with him. He sent the disciples who were concerned. You are the one the Lord wants to send. You are okay by him. You are good enough to be sent. You are concerned he wants to send you. My sister, don't think what can I do? You are the one God is eyeing. Nehemiah knew this. So he began to, he changed his prayer in verse 11. He said, oh, let me find favor in the sight of this man. He already, God dropped a burden in his heart already on what to do. As if God was saying, yes, I've had your prayers, but who shall I send? Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And you know what Isaiah also said that day? He said, here am I, send me. One, one responsibility you will take is to take responsibility for what is happening in your nation for God to use you to change it. You are going to pray and say, Lord, here am I, send me. Send me. I cannot say I'm not seeing what is happening. Lord, send me. Grant me favor. Send me. So the next chapter opened. And it says in verses 1 to 5. I'll just stop for now in verse 5. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Ataxaxis, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never, never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad? Since you are not sick, this is nothing but sorrow of heart. Then I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may Build it. You can see that ever before we came to the point of come, let us build, a man singularly took responsibility. It is not, first of all, a matter of committee setting, a matter of group, group work. You as a person, you are the one God is speaking to. Take responsibility personally. He said, you know, he came to the king that day, that particular day, as he was praying and fasting for many days. It is the rule that when you are appearing before the king, you don't appear sad. And he has been appearing, all right, every day, though he was fasting and praying. And the king didn't know that something was happening to this man. That day, he dared the devil. He dared to be sad. Whatever will happen, let it happen. If I perish, let me perish. That's why he was praying for favor. Because if they meet him sad, if the king saw his face sad, that may be the end of him. That's what used to happen in Babylon. But now he decided to to bring forth what was happening in his heart. He was not going to be making up his face. He, sh he showed what was in his heart. He was looking sad. And the king noticed it. Normally, once the king noticed it, if not for God's favor, they could carry him away and kill him. 
How can you be sad before the king? But God granted him favor. And as soon as the king saw him, he said, why is your face sad? Since you are not sick, this is nothing but sorrow of heart. Then I became dreadfully afraid. Why was he afraid? That's to show you that a cup bearer must never appear before the king sad. He was afraid whether that would be the end of him. But God gave him favor. And he said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lie waste and his gates are burned with fire? He brought out what was in his heart. You, what is in your heart now? You've been here in God's presence for, for these few days. What has been in your heart? Mind you, you are not going from here unless you receive a burden from God. Before we finish this meeting, before we finish this message, you will bow down your head and plead with God, Lord, what will you have me to do? I want to take responsibility. Lord, what is your concern about, about the church in my nation, in Botswana? What is your concern about Nam Namibian church? Lord, Lesotho, Eswatini, what is your concern? Lord, what, what is troubling your mind about the church in Malawi? True, I've been doing whatever I could to serve God, but I want to bear your, your body. Pour it into my heart. What will you have me to do? This man brought it out very clearly. He said, I prayed to the God of heaven. It, that must have been a, a minute prayer because he was still standing before the king and God gave him courage to bring it out. And he said, why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste? Could you imagine? He was even emotional about it. He identified with it. He said, the place of my father's tomb. Why should I be sad when it, I mean, should I not be sad when it is lying waste and its gates are burned with fire? Are you concerned about the concerns of God, about the church and the nation? You can't go from here without bearing that burden in the womb of your heart. You can't go from here without taking responsibility. He said to the king, oh, I'm bothered. And he brought it out clearly. He brought the burden that God has dropped in his heart. And then the king said to me, so what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. My sister, what do you request about the church? Are you, are you okay? Why will your father in heaven be sad about the church in your nation? And you are okay. You're going about your, father, your business as if nothing is happening. Surely you are not all right. This man brought it out. And the king says, so what is your request? And God is facing each one of us here today also. What is your request about the church? I will grant it. What is your request about Botswana? The nation of Botswana, and I will grant it. In recent times, the, the, the government of Botswana is concerned about the young people. Are you concerned? Are you concerned about it? God is saying, bring that concern to me. I will grant your request. He says, what is your request? And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah. Lord, send me to my people. Lord, send me to the church. Send me. Send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Are you articulate about what your request is? Do you know what God will have you to do? What is the burden that God has dropped in your heart? You must be concerned and you must be able to articulate it. What is God saying to your heart? What is God saying? 
When you say, I want to build, what do you want to build? Come, let us go and build. It is not a group issue first. You are the one to be concerned. You must be concerned about God's people. You must be concerned about the issue, the situation of marriage in, your, in, your, in the church, in your nation. Look at how marriage has been bastardized. Look at women marry women, men marry men. And you say, wow, that's them. I don't know why they, they have allowed that. Even the church, hey, even the church, even the priest. And you are not bothered, you just say it carelessly. God is interested that you as a person, you will take responsibility about the situation of marriage in the church. First of all, before we even talk about the nation. What is the situation of marriage in, in, in the church in Botswana, in South Africa? What is the situation? Does marriage really last? Has it not been bastardized? Do they not divorce at will? What is happening? I singled out marriage because that is the beginning. Apart from our personal work with God that we have been talking about since the beginning of this meeting, you must begin to now look at the issue of marriage. Because when God wanted to work on the earth at the beginning, he made marriage. He used marriage. He used couples to do his work. God wants to start again. And he will start with marriage. What is the situation of marriage in your nation? When we began to be concerned here in Boko about marriage, because every day, 90% of those who came to our office for counseling were people who had marriage problems. They came, they came, and they we would spend time from morning till night counseling them. It became a burden in our hearts that we started praying about. And we took up the challenge. We took responsibility. And we developed marriage outlines, outlines about marriage, biblical marriage, original marriage. That was when we began to discover the difference between Genesis chapter 2 marriage and Genesis chapter 3 marriage. They are completely different. Genesis chapter 2 marriage was about the original marriage that God created. And the principles are very clear there. Genesis chapter 3 marriage is the marriage, the falling marriage. And that was how we started developing this outlines that became the book, a Bible study book uh, on building a fulfilling marital relationship. It was not a book, first of all. We developed outlines, Bible study outlines of marriage. And we started studying here in Boko. And we studied it week after week. And for two years, we studied on marriage. We didn't break it. Uh, this one that you will say, okay, okay, we have studied uh, um, marriage for two weeks. Let's go now to, to prosperity. Let's go now to deliverance. Let's go to demonology. Let's go now to, and you keep shifting here and there. No, you won't grow that way. You won't solve any problem. We took responsibility that God should use us to correct the issue of marriage in Boko. You can take responsibility as well. And it took us two years, you know, and we studied and studied. You can imagine studying every week, Bible studies, among few people then. And for two years, we studied. But after those two years, we rested. Issues of marriage counseling died down. So we were able to face outreaches to other people because people are no longer quarreling with themselves in the home. We took responsibility. My sister, take responsibility. A few years ago, God began to burden our hearts again about the young people that are getting married, even our disciples that were getting married. Uh -uh. They will get married and start fighting. 
disciples marrying and fighting. One particular one really bothered my heart. These were young people as singles. They were used by God. They were very zealous for God. But once these two people got married, they started fighting. I mean fighting. So to even reach out again to other young people was difficult. That burdened my heart a lot. And with that, I started praying. And that was how we started developing again, you know, to reach out onto young people who want to marry, intending, we call them intending couples. One by one, before you get married in the fellowship, you must see me, except I don't know. And we, that's how we will labor and instruct them for days. And very soon, that started occupying our time. Day after day, ah, then we had to start gathering them together. And at first, it was maybe about 14 couples. And before you know it, it became 50 couples. And we, we started what we call premarital training. <laughs> when something is a burden of your heart, God will give it wings. It will grow. And like that, 100 couples, 100 intending couples, just for a weekend, from Wednesday to Sunday, we are there studying about marriage. Nothing else. Marriage. Now, it has become an international thing among our people. The last time we, we enlisted some other nations who wanted their people to go through premarital training before they get married. Because it's helping many. Take responsibility, my sister. Don't say there is nothing I can do. Whatever it is that God wants to burden your heart with, you are going to receive a burden today. Open your heart to receive and conceive that seed. Open your heart. Let the issue of marriage be a responsibility that some of you will take up. Open your heart. Even your own marriage, you must open your heart. You are a builder. The Bible says a wise woman builds her own home. Open your heart. Build your own home. Of course, you can't talk about premarital training when your own house is not in order. Build your own home. Build your relationship with your husband. Build. Don't scatter. Enough of childishness. Some of you have been too childish, even though you are growing gray. You are childish. Hey, my husband, he, he doesn't take care of me. Oh, my husband, he doesn't even think about me. Oh, my husband, he didn't give me Christmas gift. Oh, the last time that I celebrated my birthday, my husband did not even give me a gift. You are too childish. Think kingdom. Think about the kingdom. Don't be self-centered anymore. You have done that for long enough. Take responsibility over even your own marriage to build it. Don't let everything your husband does keep offending you. You are too childish. It's a child that is easily offended. Eh? If you do a little thing to a child, yeah, 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 he beat me. He beat me. Ah, ah. What's your problem? That every little thing your husband does offends you. Drop that uh, 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 childishness and take responsibility as a bona fide heir of the kingdom of God. Build your home. Even if your husband is not yet a believer, God instructs us in 1 Peter chapter 3 on what to do to get that believer husband combated. Don't be childish. Be submissive. Have a quiet and a gentle spirit. Have have a submissive heart. That's how the holy women of old did. And they got their husbands converted. The Bible says, even if that man will not be converted because you are preaching to him, he will be converted when he watches your godly character. Because your godly conduct will speak to him more than many words. That's what to do. 
take responsibility over your family. Build it. And then look out there to so many other families that are languishing. If you face that aspect, do you know something will begin to happen? Not only in the church, but in your nation. Take responsibility. Some will have to face the children. Nehemiah faced the building of the wall and he faced the revival of the people. He faced the building of the gates of Jerusalem that was burned down and the stones that were burned with fire to revive the stones. You know we are living stones. And the stones are already burned with fire. You can take responsibility over this these stones, these living stones, the children who will build the church tomorrow. You can take responsibility to raise children for God. They are everywhere. Whether you are single or you are aged or you are of childbearing age, you can take responsibility to reach out to children to build them. Take responsibility personally before we will say, come, let us build. You are the one God is eyeing first. See children everywhere. There is nowhere you go, you won't see children. What are you doing about that? Is your heart touched? Are you touched that children, even children are going to Christless eternity? Do you ever imagine that when they die, when children die, they go to heaven? No, they go to hell. Could God be telling you? Could God be speaking to you that you are the one to take responsibility over the issue of the children around you? Take responsibility. The Bible says concerning our children, how we, we can get them First of all, indoctrinated with the word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at what the Bible says. We will read from verse 6 to verse 9. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9 it says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You can catch your children like that. And the children around you, he said, but this word must first be in your heart. We said the heart is the heart of the matter. Let the word of God fill your heart and then it will overflow to your children and to the children around you. You will teach them diligently. Diligence means hard work. The work of building is a hard work. You start from the foundation and you start putting one block on top of the other. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You will talk to them about the word of God when you sit in your house. Can you gather children and just sit down? Just sit down like a play, like you are playing. You are talking the word of God. You are speaking the word of God. You are telling them Bible stories. Don't you think it will not sink? It will sink in their heart and it may become the pillars in their hearts. When you lie down, talk to them about it. When you, when you are walking by the way, talk to them about it. When you rise up, talk to children about it. Can you begin to gather two, three, four, five children around you and speak to them about the word of God? Take responsibility. You may not do everything. You may not be the one that will do everything, but about children. God is dropping that burden in your heart. Face it squarely. Face it, face it. Let the Lord help your heart to do something about it. Take responsibility about the children. Take responsibility to build good relationships around you in your neighborhood. Somebody has a problem. 
Don't take away your eyes from it. That may be the opportunity you are looking for. Somebody died around you. Take responsibility to visit. You are doing something. When you visit, share the word of God. Just a little gospel. You don't know what that will do. Somebody has fallen among thieves like that uh, good Samaritan did. Don't say, oh, he doesn't come to our church. Let him go to his people, his church people. They will help him. No. Be the good, good uh, Samaritan who will care for that man that has fallen into the hands of thieves. Take responsibility to do good in your neighborhood. That may become the open door for the gospel. Take responsibility. Each one of us must take responsibility for one thing or the other so that the purpose of God will, become, will be accomplished and, and there will be revival. Even the church will be revived and the devil will be kicked out. Take responsibility, my sister, even about the young women around you. Young ladies, those who are not yet married and those who are married newly. Can you focus on that? Because look, the gates have been burned with fire. The gates of virginity has been burned with fire. Nobody cares any longer. Before they say they want to now marry, they have aborted two, three, four times. Can you revise that? Can you allow God to use you to revive these stones that have been burned with fire? Can God use you to start celebrating virginity, purity, when somebody is single, to live pure? Can you take responsibility so that God will use you to revive the stones that are born with fire? You shall rebuild the ancient ruins, says the Lord. Can you think deeply about things that have been burnt with fire and let God use you to revive? To bring revival to the church in that aspect? The Bible says, let the older women teach the younger women. Can you develop interest in the younger women, my sister? Don't just stay in your own cocoon, doing your own things, concerned about your own concerns, and you are so selfish and self-centered. You are not bothered about what is happening in the church. Can you deliberately join the choir only for you to be able to reach out to them? You know how to sing. You know all the soprano, all the alto, all the tribal. Can you join the choir? And you know what happens in the choir in many churches? The sexual immorality that takes place is terrible. Can you take responsibility for the choir in your church and for the music that our people listen to? God can use you to change it. And then, oh, you will find people that God will begin to use to sing the praises of our God out of a pure heart. You can take responsibility about the choir in your church and in the churches around. You can do a music concert and begin to talk about the kingdom of God, kingdom music. Take responsibility, my sister. Can you take responsibility over the different aspects of the church? Even the women fellowship, they are looking for somebody who has a body for women to, to, to handle women fellowship. Can you also take responsibility and say, ah, women will not go down the drain when I'm alive. And take that responsibility to build women. You, you alone, God is talking to you personally first. Take responsibility. Even about your profession, you may be a professional. Take responsibility, please, about the way that profession is being handled in an ungodly manner. Are you a nurse? Are you a teacher? Are you a doctor? Are you a lawyer? Does it not bother you how corruption has crept into that profession? Will you please take responsibility for the kingdom of God to be established in that profession? This morning, God is challenging us to take responsibility. And before we will pray finally after this message, we are going to first take a few minutes. Two, three, four minutes. You will bow down your heart 
and your head before God and be quiet in the presence of God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? As you are saying, come, let us build. And you are challenging me as a person to first take responsibility. Nehemiah took personal responsibility first before he went to the elders of Israel in Judah. And he told them, and he said, come, let us build. Until you take responsibility personally, you have no mouth to gather people to take responsibility. Can you bow your head for these few minutes and listen to God he wants to speak to you? My sister, this moment is a very crucial moment in this meeting. God must speak to you as he spoke to Nehemiah. He knew his own was not to go and build the temple. His own was to build the walls of Jerusalem, and that was what he concentrated upon. Ezra built the temple. Ezra built the altar. God has another person to do another thing. You must hear God. What will God have you to take responsibility to do? You can't go from here and remain the same. God will not allow you. You will not have rest. In fact, I'm going to pray that you will not have rest until you take responsibility about one particular aspect of the kingdom to build it. Will you bow down and pray? These few minutes is for us to hear God. Don't just talk like a parrot throughout. Speak to God. Lord, what will you have me to do? And be quiet. God has something to tell you. Let's pray. Let's round up our prayers. May the Lord give you the grace. May he give you the divine push to take responsibility over what he has told you in the name of Jesus Christ. We are pressing on with the message before we pray finally. But please take note of what God has told you. Write it down. You must never forget. God wants you to take responsibility. You will not go from here saying, I don't know what to do. And then you go back into your cocoon. God forbid it in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the book of Haggai, chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 1 to 12. Agai chapter 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, 
the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, These people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withheld the dew, and the earth withholds its fruits. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains and the grain and the new wine and the oil uh, on uh, whatever the ground brings forth, on men and on livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God has sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. The Lord is asking us to take responsibility. Some of us don't know the time we are in. It is time to build the temple of God. It is time for us to arise and contribute our quota as women to build the house of God. The church is in ruins, as we have seen. It, it was too, too bad that these people did not know divine timing. The other day we were reading Psalm 102, verse 13, where the Lord is saying the time to favor Zion has come. The time, indeed, the set time has come. But many of us don't know it. If you do the right thing at the wrong time, it will not be done. And if you sit down at the right time to build and you don't rise up to build, then nothing will be built. We must not rise up at the wrong time. This is the set time to build. And a little contribution that you make will be so valuable in the sight of God. These people sat down. They were building their own houses, paneled houses. And when it came to the, to the building of the body of Christ, they say, God has forsaken us. It's not time yet. When it is time, God will tell us. God is telling you now, it is time to build. It is time to build your homes. It is time to build marriage. It is time to build the young people. They are the people of, the, of tomorrow. They will be the leaders of tomorrow. It is time to build the children. It is time. It is time. It is time to build the young people. It is time. It is time to build young women. It is time to build our professions in a godly way. It is time to build righteousness in our nations. It is time. The gates that are born with fire, it is time to build them. This is the right time. Don't sit down and say, tomorrow I will do it. No, this is the time. God is saying, look at you. You are saying it is not time. But you are building your own houses. But look at what I have done. Have you not seen the signs? You run, you build your career. You build a lot of things. You build your finance. You build your, your, your business. 
And God says, I came, I blew on it. And you don't know that it's because you neglected building my house. It's not wrong to build your career. It's not wrong to build your business. But when you are building your business and you forget to build the kingdom, it means you are earthly minded. God will blow on what you are building and it will crush. It will crash. God says, verse 4 and verse 5, is it time for you yourself to dwell in your pioneer houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Sit down to think a bit of what is happening around you and to you. You have so much and you bring in little. Don't you know something is happening? Don't you know God is angry with you? You so much, you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but you are not warm. You earn wages. And God makes sure you earn the wages on a bag with holes. It leaks away. You use the money as hospital bills. You use the money to bury the dead. People are dying here and there, and they say, bring money. We must buy coffee. And you don't consider your ways that God is angry. It's because you are not putting the, the, the building of the kingdom of God around you into cognizance. God blows on your wages. It leaks away. You spend it on hospital bills. Your children are falling sick every now and then. And you are not thinking. You are not thoughtful to, know, to, to ask God, Lord, but why? Why is it that all my salary is going on paying hospital bills and burying the dead? You are earning wages on a bag having holes. Consider your ways. It's because you have neglected to build the, the church of God, to build the purpose of God, to build the kingdom of God, to build. You are not taking responsibility for the purpose of God in your environment. That's why you are earning your wages on a bag having holes. Consider your ways. And God is saying, go up the mountain. Get wood to build. Go up the mountain. Get precious stones to build. Go into the presence of God and get materials to build the children, to build families, to build marriage in your nation. Get materials, precious materials to build the young people, the young women. They don't know how to marry well. They don't know how to behave to their husbands. Can you please get up to the mountains in the presence of God and get precious materials to build? As a person, take responsibility to build. The Lord sent this message through Agai and the people rose up and obeyed God. May you rise up from here to obey God in the name of Jesus Christ. Nehemiah rose up. He took responsibility. And in that chapter 2, he said to the king, send me. Send me to the place of my father's tombs and I will build it. Can you tell God, Lord, send me. Send me, here am I. Send me to, to the children. Send me to my family. I want to build my home now. I'm not going to be childish anymore. Send me to married people. Send me to young people to train them on how to marry properly. Lord, send me. Send me to the people. Send me. Send me that I may teach people how to behave in the kingdom. Send me that I may train them on how to be good Christians. Send me. Send me to the unbelievers on the streets. Send me. Send me, Lord. Here am I send me. And when the king sends you, you will lack nothing. When the king sent Nehemiah, he even wrote a letter and gave him a letter of authority to the keeper of the forest to give him enough wood. There will be favor. You will have favor with God when it is God sending you. You are going to be praying this, this day. You are going to call on God, please send me. When God sent Nehemiah, he went he took responsibility and it was as he went and he looked around to find out 
to do a survey of the calamity that had befallen the people, and he saw it for himself. It was only then he began to involve other people. He first took responsibility. Can you take responsibility as a person? And you will see God sending people to help you in that work. If you take responsibility over the young women that are marrying and divorcing, if you take responsibility about children, God will send people that will help you. It is not for you to go and start a ministry of your own. There is enough, enough number of churches in our town, in our nation. They are enough. Contribute your quota to build in that church, in this other church, in this other church. Gather them together. You don't have to name it. Just contribute what God has put in, in you. What, what you have gone to, to the presence of God to, to receive. Go to the mountain. Receive the resources. And begin to build. God will send laborers into his vineyard. But you must take responsibility first. Before we say, come and let us build. You must take responsibility personally. And you have prayed. What is God asking you to take responsibility about? Has God spoken to you? You are going to bring that, that responsibility before God now and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Is God putting an idea in your heart? Don't think it's an ordinary idea. It is God doing something. He's, he's beginning to ginger you to take responsibility. I tell you, you don't have to start a, a different ministry. Uh -uh. The, work of, the work of God is not an individualistic ministry. In the body of Christ, we contribute our God-given grace. This one brings his own. What every, what every joint supplies it is what results in the building up of the body of Christ. It is not one, what one single woman will say he, she can do. No! You will first of all respond to God and begin to labor. Begin to labor. Labor, labor. Contribute to the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not one denomination. Contribute. Is God burdening your heart about the young people that are yet to marry? Is it about children? Is it about youth work? Laboring to build them in the kingdom way? Would you like to respond to God and say, Lord, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Is it about the profession that God has put you into? Is it about the market women who don't know their left from their right? They don't even go to church again. Can you focus on them and find a way and find a time to be meeting with them and building them? You will tell God this morning, here am I, send me. That is the burden this morning. Take responsibility. And who among you is saying, Lord, I'm ready to take responsibility. Here am I, send me. We're going to pray together right now. We're going to call on God. Let the hand of God come upon you to send you. He will send you. He's going to shoot you forth with his grace and power. But you must agree with him first and say, Lord, here am I. Please send me. Would you like to stand on your feet again this morning and begin to pray to God and say, Lord, send me. Send me. I must not go from this meeting aimlessly. Not able to pinpoint what God will have me to do to build. The people of God are in distress. Jerusalem gates have been broken down and burnt with fire. Everything comes in and at will, they, they come into the church without needing permission. Will you pray that God will send you? Is God putting the burden in your heart? You will do like Nehemiah. You will sit down. You will consider. You will mourn. You will weep. You will fast. You will pray as you go from here. And say, Lord, please send me. Please send me. Send me. Lord, send me. Please pray as you are standing on your feet. Pray. Talk to God. And say, Lord, I will no longer sit down. There is no rest. There is no peace. 
until the Lord has his way. Call on the Lord. Ah, oh, my Lord, have your way. In my life from today, there is no rest. There is no peace until the Lord has his way. I place my life in your hands. Rest secured in your plans. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Have your way. Will you tell the Lord, have your way in my life? Enough of roaming around, doing self-centered things. Enough for sitting down complacently. Woe to those women in Jerusalem who sit down complacently. Woe to the women who are complacent in Jerusalem. Will you pray, Lord, no more complacency for me. I must put my hands to the work of the Lord. I must put my hands to the building up of the broken down walls. Lord, have your way. Lord, please send me. Send me, Lord, send me. Who among you is saying, Lord, send me, and you mean it? Would you like to lift up your hands to heaven and come to the altar? God is going to propel you with his grace. God is going to send you. Something will happen to your heart. You will no longer be able to sit down complacently. God himself will bring ideas into your mind on what to do at every given point in time. Will you come out, please? We don't have much time again. Will you come out and say, here am I, Lord? God is saying, whom shall I send? Among you women, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Who will build for us what has broken down? Who will build even with her prayers? Who will sit in the presence of God, mourning, crying, weeping for the destruction of my people? Who among you? Who among you will bear the burden before the Lord? Who among you will build the homes that are broken down? Who among you will reach out to the divorcees? Who will reach out unto the young married ladies? Who will reach out unto the ladies that are yet to get married to teach them how to marry properly? Who among you will rise up to build the children, to build the young people? And you are saying, here am I, Lord, please send me. Please come out. We want to pray right now. Will you say to the Lord, please send me. Let it be your hand sending me. I don't want to send myself. I don't want to send myself. Lord, send me. Send me. Send me. As you are coming out, lift up your two hands to heaven and say, Lord, have your way in my life from today. Here am I. Send me. Send me, Lord. Send me. Send me. Don't let me go back home the same, complacently. No, I want to be involved in the work of my Lord. There were some noble people in, a, in Nehemiah chapter 3 who did not put their hand to the work of their Lord. You will not be like those people, noble but useless. Noble but unable to do anything. There were people, even young ladies, who built with their fathers next to their house. They built. They contributed to the building of the world. What are you going to do? What is God putting in your heart? Has God spoken to you? Come out with that body and say, here am I now. Lord, propel me. Send me. Send me. I will no longer be complacent in the work of my Lord. Send me, Lord. Here am I. Send me. Send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. Please send me. Send me, Lord. Send me. Please keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep pleading with God. I'd like to take a song as we, we are praying. The song says, only remembered for what we have done. Only remembered for what we have done. What is it that you'll be remembered for? Fading away 
like the stars of the morning, losing their light in the glorious sun. Those who we pass from the earth and is toiling, only remembered by what we have done. Only remembered, only remembered, only remembered by what we have done. Those who we pass from the earth and is toiling, only remembered by what we have done. Shall we be missed? Though by others succeeded, reaping the fields we in springtime have done, have sown. No, for the sowers may pass from their labors, only remembered by what we have done. Only the truth that in life we have spoken. Only the seed that on earth we have sown, these shall pass onward when we are forgotten. Fruit of the harvest and what we have done. Only remembered, only remembered, only remembered by what we have done. Thus will we pass from the earth and its toily, only remembered by what we have done. What will you be remembered for? What will you be remembered for? Take responsibility this morning and say, Lord, send me. And if you are there at the altar, will you lift up your two hands and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Send me. We are praying right now. Our Father, we thank you for this morning and for your word to us. Thank you, Lord, for, for challenging our hearts to take responsibility because you are ready now to send us. Now here we are. Look at these ones who have come out to meet you at the altar. I pray now, Father, let your hands of grace, your hands of power come upon them in a new way in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask, oh Lord, as they have responded to you and as they have responded to what you have said to them to be involved in, send them in the name of Jesus Christ. Let your grace come upon them in a new way. Let your hand come upon them as it came upon Ezekiel, that by their hands dry bones shall live again in the name of Jesus Christ. Stones that have been burnt will come alive again. The living stones in the temple, they will come alive again by their hands in the name of Jesus Christ. Send us with your blessings. Send us with your power. Send us with your grace. Send us with your anointing. In the name of Jesus Christ, let the work of God prosper in our hands from now. Let the burden of, of God come upon our hearts as it came on Nehemiah. In the name of Jesus Christ, when we cry unto you, hear our prayer, answer our cry. In the name of Jesus Christ, let your favor come upon us on every side, that your work will prosper in our hands. Lord, as you continue with us in this meeting, we pray that our hearts and our eyes will yet be opened unto what you want to do with us and in us in the name of Jesus Christ. Let your glory rest upon us in the nations of Southern Africa. Let the nations know that God is sending certain women who are ready to do his work and bring the glory of God down upon the church again. Let it be so concerning each one of us in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you because we will never remain the same again. Complacency is gone out from each one of us in the name of Jesus Christ. 
We will no longer be lazy in the work of the Lord. We will not be slothful in serving the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. We are so grateful for speaking to us the way we have done, you have done. And as you have spoken to us about the responsibility you want us to take, may we never forget it. May we pursue it with all the vigor that God gives. Thank you, Father. Take all the glory this morning. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.